we're, we're here in the annotation lab. And so um, maybe you should explain what's going on here, Una. So you, you've navigated down to a certain part, right? Yeah, well, hi everyone. Um, I joined Alan this morning because I was having a hard time finding um, the, uh, the materials to annotate. And also um, I had forgotten how to log into Hypothesis, but <laughs> after all of that, we are now actually going in and um, annotating directly um, uh, the wording of the UNESCO recommendations. Um, and in fact, I just <clears throat> did a, I just did a recommendation on, uh, tell me, Alan, which, which one was it? Uh, the question where he looks like on public, um, I think it was under the training. What was the letter? Do you remember? Oh, the integral part of training programs. So yeah. it was, it was B under member states are recommended to strategically plan and support OER capacity building. And one, uh, we had another comment from uh, Remy, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, on making OER an integral part of training programs at all levels of education. And uh, Remy had suggested that um, this would be perfect for teacher education programs. And I absolutely agree with that. And then I mentioned that um, in the community colleges, um, a lot of new faculty training and orientation now involves um, some OER awareness of what is available in their discipline. So before they choose the instructional materials for their courses, they're really well informed and uh, can make some really good choices. And, and this is great. I mean, this example of um, adding just a short note of commentary that sort of um, illustrates or highlights um, an aspect that someone else can maybe then respond to or add on to um, with maybe a specific example or um, say like, you know, we need more of this or this is why, or we've done research. So there's all kinds of ways that you can go. But um, we, we started with this by a little bit of discussion about trying to find the right words to annotate. And so one way in is to look at the notes that have been added and seeing what information you can contribute um, on top of this. So uh, there, there's, there's, as I've been trying to explain to my colleagues, there's not a rule here or a right or wrong way to do this. I think every note added is, is an addition and, and adds to um, the, this document itself. Uh, right, I and I, I'm definitely gonna add some concrete examples too from the Community College Consortium for OER. Yeah. Um, because I think um, our members are doing this all the time and, and we uh, support them in, in their work. So I, yeah. So. And you put a tag in. So if, if other people are putting information about CCC OER, uh, we could definitely see the aggregate of um, all those tags. Yeah, that might be, it might be fun too um, for um, us, you know, to gather up, you know, at some point uh, that information and maybe, uh, you know, blog a little bit about, um, what folks um, who are associated with CCCOER had to say about the annotation. So, you know, sometimes it's kind of fun to look at a sector um, as well as looking at the whole picture. Right, now if, um, I'm gonna take over screen sharing in a second, if that's okay. Okay, at least I'll stop sharing. And then I'm going to um, show something pretty neat. I, I'll get this URL. So um, th there's a tool um, that Ramey, <laughs> Ramey Kalir, who is going to be on later, um, the author of the annotation book, um, had, had told me about a couple of years ago. And this, this works with hypothesis to take activity around a single document and provide kind of some analytics so you can see the activity. So your annotation is there as the most recent one. Yeah. Um, and then as we go down, we can see um, as we go along the activity of who's been in here doing annotation, um, et cetera, and even like threads. So this is a sort of interesting way um, to sort of surface the activity that's going on within the annotation space. Um, and ah. I think that's pretty neat. Can you share that tool with me or is it someplace? Yep, yep. I, I will. I'm gonna put the link right in the chat for you. Um, it's, you. it's on the page and we will have one set up for um, each of the language versions um, of the recommendations since we have activity uh, starting up in Spanish and French um, as well. Yeah, I saw that. Neat, neat. 
So hi, Paul, you were just telling me about uh, your experience annotating and, and what, what have you sort of, the, the process of doing it, what's kind of come to mind for you? Yeah, I think, well, uh, yeah, so I just spent like an hour and a half doing some annotations in the OER recommendations, it's kind of fun. It makes you really reflect on, you know, what currently is happening globally around open education resources and the efforts to implement that that could be used as examples for others to understand what they themselves might do. And, and I think as we were chatting about the other day, I mean, part of it is like some of the things that the recommendation calls for are actions by governments, by member states. But in many ways, I think the OER recommendation also provides a bit of a framework for how a school or an institution or even a department might think about what would we do to uh, make open education, open education resources a part of the way we do education. And so um, in that context, you know, both for government and for kind of those who actually would then implement whatever our government supports in terms of legislation. I think the recommendation provides a lot of good guidance. You know, it's actually, it's pretty good. <laughs> and there's a lot to it. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I put in quite a few annotations to things that are existing initiatives already underway in different parts of the world. Uh, and then a few reflections about some of the things the annotation calls for um, mm -hmm. or suggests, you know, that that implementation of open education resources involves changing pedagogy and potentially transforming education. Like those are like, that is, that's big stuff. It's, 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 uh, it's both a kind of potential and also a promise. Um, you know, it, it's like, if you get going down this path, then not only will you create higher quality open education resources, but you potentially have the uh, ability to transform education into something that really is inclusive and participatory. Is your window still open? <laughs> Can you show us your annotations? <laughs> oh, oh, oh uh, yeah, let me see here. Because uh, I, I think, I mean, my, my idea was it would be good to have a group of people in here. Um, I mean, you actually muted um, while I was talking to Una and did your own mm -hmm. annotation activity. Um, and I just, I mean, this is kind of somewhere in between, like it's not really a live event, but I think there's something to be said for being able to do this um, like together, almost like, like an art studio's work. You know, people are focused on their own artwork, but that yeah. doing the same act in proximity, I think has some kind of energy level to it, or I would like to think so. Yeah, I think I think there's merit to that. I I, um, I also feel like sometimes it is you know you and I have talked a lot about what annotation might entail, but then I think sometimes just doing it it's a bit like you know when you're studying for home you know doing your homework and you're studying sometimes it's helpful to have a group discussion, but other times you just kind of have to like hone in and focus on what what it is that it's asking you to do. And I think there's a lot of merit for both of those activities. I really appreciated actually having this lab drop-in created to provide a place where we can talk about it, but also a place where, you know, you can actually hone in and focus and get some of it, uh, get some of it done. Um, yeah, I think there's, yeah. as you're finding your screen, I think, like just being able to look at that same part of the document and talk about like what whether words speak to you or whether like you know, where do I you know put something in that there seems to be sort of like a is this the right way is this the right kind of thing that to put in there? Uh, and we don't we don't know um, <laughs> we don't know I know uh, yeah actually here let me just I'll just share do a little screen share here thank I think. you yeah let's do this. Yeah, so um, here's a few things that I put in. So I did put in something about transforming education, that mm -hmm. it's, you know, that it is both a promise, but also a challenge in some ways, and a little bit of my own reflections on what, what 
that entails, because I think if we're really talking about fully implementing open education, it's kind of a adopting not just the resources that we might create, but a set of values and principles and practices. And so that's, in a sense, what has the potential to be transformative. Right. Um, I also put in open science, you know, okay, because you it references here that it'd be great for policies to consider, yes, open education resources, but also the work that's happened around open access, open data, open source software, and open science. And and you know, while UNESCO has just you know in 2019 released or formally adopted the open education resources recommendation, just um, well, in November, just this, like in November 2021, last month, they also, all the member states adopted the open science recommendation. So here we have two recommendations adopted by all UNESCO member states that are advocating for the use of open ideas and practices and values for science and for education. And so, you know, I think there's a growing recognition that these uh, that this notion of open has relevance across many facets of how we operate as societies, both for science, for education, for software, and so on. And so, so when it comes to making policies, I think it's helpful perhaps to think about the big macro framework, and then maybe we just need one policy that encompasses all of them, or perhaps we need unique policies for each of these. But I did link to the, the UNESCO Open Science recommendation. And someone, um, sorry, so, someone who yeah. might be coming across it could see that there's an annotation for open science. They don't have to add a new one. They can just tack on, like, yeah. uh, this is an example of initiative that, that's going on here in, in Germany, when this is, these are the things that we're doing. Um, right. And then someone else could say, like, um, well, we really like, like to try to get this going in Vietnam, but how do we like do this? And so it's, yeah. um, I think annotating is, is not only just adding like that first note, but being part of the conversation about it. Yeah, yeah, I did reply to some of the annotations that other people have made too. So that's kind of fun, right? So you can just kind of build on it. Um, I did put in some stuff here about teacher professional development, you know, just some of the existing, mm programs and courses that are already created that, that are uh, really about professional development. And, and also, you know, most of these are like openly licensed, making them adaptable and reusable by anyone who, who wants to kind of build out something similar. And same with networks of experts, you know, like Open Education Global, our organization has several of them. And so I think it's, I think part of what I see the annotation accomplishing is that when you read the recommendation, it can feel like it's a bit overwhelming. <laughs> it's kind of yeah. daunting to go, oh my gosh, how could we possibly implement this? And, and the annotations, I think, provide some guidance on that, that help it not feel so overwhelming and, and make it seem oh well we can take like incremental little steps by choosing to you know implement some of these particular pieces that that help us gradually make progress as opposed to like we have to do everything <laughs> it's like it feels like it's impossible uh, so anyways those are some of the things that i was thinking about and adding and doing as i was working on this well thank you paul i can i can grant you your um OE global <laughs> Open my... <laughs> badge, and I will. I will I'll, I'm going to start doing this. I'll, I'll challenge you the next time to bring two more people into the lab. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, it's been a pleasure to join you and Rosa, the annotator, uh, <laughs> and Una and others that are. And I hope it goes well, Remy, as well. And I, I, I saw some uh, annotations from a number of people. So. Mm -hmm. So I think the more, yeah, there's something about the more we bring into this process, even just for short chunks of time mm -hmm. um, and engage in it, the richer it becomes. So thanks so much for making it possible, Alan. You're doing some yeoman's work here. Thanks, Paul. I'll see you later. <laughs> thank you, Ola Marcella. And uh, thank you for dropping into the annotation lab. And so you, you've gotten a start with 
uh, putting some notes into the Spanish language version of the recommendation. And uh, I'm just curious if you can sort of talk out loud about your approach for doing this and, and what seems to be beneficial. Well, for me, first of all, I think that the, the benefit of the having the opportunity to work in a document like the, like the recommendation of the UNESCO OER is that sometimes you're just browsing or information comes to you and then you don't know what to do it with it. So finding a way of connecting those two things is very useful for me in regards of doing something like this, uh, the annotation. I have to be honest, this is the first time that I've been using this resource and I have been loving it. Uh, so now being led by my colleague, Anna Levine of doing this activity, I think that I was thinking of it both ways. One, thinking of what the recommendation is and having the five action areas in mind and trying to think of the resources that I have available around the community and see if I could find the connection there. But um, I can see being worked around the other way too, like having a really good resource and finding a way to insert it into the recommendation. So I, I don't think of it as a one line process, but more like finding a way how things can connect. Um, and also this document is, I think that it's the perfect length and it's, it's very clear and very structured that made it also very easy to how to connect some of the resources into the document. So for example, one of the first annotations that I found here was this word dinamico y colaboración, which really is not particularly uh, making reference to one of the action areas, which people would mainly go to that first. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, oh, how clever of doing it, just how the dinamismo y colaboración, two very specific words that are in reference to the recommendation, not highlighting the action area. So this was a great example that was there actually done by, by you, Alan. And, uh, and I thought that was a very clever way of doing it. What I started doing initially, uh, which I thought was the easiest way for me to start this process was identify the main topics and then work my, work, my way down. Um, so what I did was during OE Global, we had a seminar that was highlighting the action areas in Spanish and in the Latin America region. So that was a very easy connection between what we had created the tracks in the conference and then finding this document. And again, as a way of not losing that information and making sure that this can be a push forward to somebody else that maybe was not able to be at the conference and also the opportunity of having these conversations be um, all around these specific topics was a very easy connection to make with the document. So what I did was look for the, the topics, in this case, the first one, which is uh, for uh, Desarrollo de Capacidades, which is uh, capacity building, which is a topic of today. And, um, and yeah, so I, you just link it. It's a very straightforward way of doing things. Nice. Uh, you just link the title and then add your comment. Does that, um, I had discussion earlier with someone else, like does that phrase building capacity resonate for many people or is it, because it could be many things. I mean, the document talks about awareness and, and a lot of it talks about um, you know, all the support mechanisms that uh, organizations do to help people um, do more with OER, um, but maybe building capacity is an unusual phrasing. It is, I think that it is, but also it's unusual in a way that can be broadened into other things. So if you just think of building capacity, what does that mean to me, for example, is like making sure that you have like the, the working force to develop something. Mm -hmm. um, and in at least in going back to these seminars the, or the highlights that were made, made during the Latin America session was we need to train, build our people or train our people to make sure that we can build more capacity, meaning like we have, provide them the resources for them to create more. Um, 
And, but yes, I see your point of, of building capacity not being a very common phrase, but I, well, me personally, I do like it. Mm -hmm. I think that it, it gives an opportunity to, um, to, to give more than just let's do um, like professional development or something like that. That could be the one that we have been highlighting, but it can also translate to many other things, I would think. Yeah, and it's it's almost towards um I don't know creating potential um is another exactly way. yeah and so like having now some annotation experience um like what what can you say what, what does it offer why would people um why should they go to this trouble um and um and even if you want to like explain in Spanish that that'd be Fantastic too. <laughs> well, first of all, I have to say that it's it's no trouble at all. I think that uh, as you and I have been discussing in the past, it's more of like a habit forming thing. Mm -hmm. I think that we are usually all surrounded by content all the time that uh, finding a way or developing a habit of connecting that content to something else and actually you're really good at it, uh, like curating the information in a way to, for me, that's a way that I'm looking at it, like, oh, let me not forget about mm -hmm. this. So I think that this annotation process makes that easy um, to make sure that that information that you found and that it's valuable to you, mm -hmm. find a way into something that you can go back and, um, and review later or have just their tag. And, um, and yes, yeah, switching to Spanish, I would, e invitaría a todos mis colegas este, que trabajan con educación abierta a tratar de hacer este, conexiones con los recursos en español que tenemos, que, que tenemos muchos, son extraordinarios, y qué mejor manera de poder hacer este proceso de anotación eh, compartiendo con el mundo los recursos que tenemos disponibles a nuestra disposición en las cinco áreas este, de la recomendación de una escorrea. Eh, la manera de que lo pudiéramos hacer es nada más encontrando un espacio, una frase o incluso un título y conectar la información que, se, que sea relevante a ese título y poder de esta manera construir entre todos un documento que puede enriquecer aún más a la población de habla hispana. Muy bueno, I, I really appreciate this. Um, I'm just doing a little bit of um, recording some clips. Uh, Alex is here. You, you know Alex, right? Yes, of course. Uh -huh. Hi, Alex. The pleasure. He was um, he, he he came in this morning, and I subjected him to a little bit of a recording. But I, I think it might help um, so people can get an understanding of what we're doing, and um, hopefully, um, and I, I keep going back. Uh, Ramy Kalir, who's coming in in a, in a few minutes, um, in the podcast we did with him, really brought up a good point. Like getting a lot of these annotations is great. But like, what if someone goes to this process and then thinks about how they could use this approach with something in their own interest area or around their own document that they would like to invite on this kind of commentary. And so that's, that's like a real beneficial outcome to think about. This is, to me, like a really simple but powerful um, open pedagogy approach um, that we'd like more people to use. Absolutely. I'm putting everybody on the spot who wanders into the lab today, so that will probably scare away everybody else. <laughs> this is great. Well, this is going to be very improvisational and very freeform, but you can see the annotated document. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. So, like, like from the very beginning, um, like this, this very first section is is a preamble, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then. You know, well, can I can I even before we get to the, to yeah. the recommendation, just kind of jump back. I think this is the French version that I was just looking at given out yeah. comments, but I, I want to jump back here because I think that this is really nicely done. If I'm being recorded and I'm sharing my screen, I'll well <laughs> give you guys a shout out and just say that I really appreciate how this has all been organized. I think that this is a really clear way of actually guiding people into a text. In a lot of cases, when people encounter social annotation and a text that is digital, it's living online somewhere, it can initially appear like it's kind of free of context. It's like, oh, I found this thing and people are like annotating it and I'm not quite sure what's going on there. And like, how do I get started and how do I find a way in? And what I appreciate is that this is again, framed as 
its own version of these texts that have been curated for a very particular purpose. And so when we look at this press books, we understand the why. And the fact that you provide the why right away is just such a helpful way of getting people to understand where they are and what they may be doing. And so that to me is really important. And then the idea that this is broken up by language, although again, we've identified and already discussed some challenges. That being said, this to me is also one way of suggesting to people that there's an intentional stance towards inclusion. There's an intentional stance towards not only centering English as the dominant language and that these activities can be social and can be collaborative across a variety of languages associated with this primary source. So that this in and of itself to me is just so well curated and organized. Then of course, there's some resources about annotation and I appreciate that you've drawn upon some of you know, our, our work and that's really humbling, but I just think also again, helpful in providing some context. And then of course the conferences. So I think this is just to me like a really nice way of multiple kinds of activities and multiple kinds of resources to really present a context for people. And that's often lacking when people sometimes stumble across a random blog post or an academic article or even an, an, a, a piece of journalism. And they're like, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be annotating this. And this to me is a really good example of, of providing that, that, that full context. So anyway, just a big shout out, Alan. I know you did a lot of work Thank you. And, and, and I have to say, like, that the original order was there was way too much up front. Um, like, like, and so I ended up rethinking, we really want people to get in annotating um, as quickly as possible. And I think I turned the why we are annotating into the practice area. Um, I always mm -hmm. thought I, I, I probably learned that from you as to like, ha have a place where people can go first just to to do the high hello sort of annotation mm -hmm. um, and, and you know before they start like you know we talked about that that am i supposed to write in the book um, <laughs> um but but yeah th thank you for that it, i'm still working on some it's fun. really i think it's this is a really nice model i think that part of this is we actually discussed in the podcast you know recently i think that part of this kind of an activity is to show other open practitioners and other advocates of open education kind of writ large, how they themselves can kind of curate not only the kinds of activities, but the technical spaces and the technical, really the architecture here that allows you to then read and write and make meaning together. And so this is, I think, just a really nice, you know, e exemplar of that. Um, but yeah, then we dive into, of course, you know, here is the text, here is the English version in this case of the OER recommendation. Um, and it does begin with this preamble. Now, I, I don't want to presume that folks who have or haven't, you know, used hypothesis before would be familiar with the hypothesis sidebar. But that's this thing that you're seeing here. Um, you can toggle it open, and you can toggle it, you know, open and closed. And some people don't know that you can actually also resize this, <laughs> bring it all the way over and all the way back. Um, what I also want to, you know, point out is that there's a few ways of navigating through then the annotations themselves and this annotation layer that's appearing on top of the text, which is that sometimes people prefer to see the annotations as they move through the text. So this is a kind of, we might call it even like a more geographic approach. It's organized by location. And we actually see that if we click on these double arrows mm. and we see that location is highlighted here. But other people might wanna see, well, what came first? Like who got here initially and what did they add? And so we can actually reorder the annotation sidebar according to its date. And we can see then in this case that the first annotation was added, Alan, by you mm -hmm. on the 29th of September. And it was actually just recently edited about a week ago or so ago. So now we're ordering these annotations sequentially, oldest to newest, or we can also reorder them by newest. And so we can see that actually our, you know, our colleague, Paul, was just in here an hour ago. And so that's really interesting to see that it looks as though, and, and to me, this is like always kind of a nice indicator of, of social presence. Well, there's Alex 36 minutes ago. So here's <laughs> a, you know, a note from Alex. Here are some notes from Paul. So here we see some, you know, some contributions from Paul that all came in about an hour ago. So we know, hey, this colleague of ours spent some time. Hmm. He, he was here, right? Like there was a sense of like social presence. These breadcrumbs were left and these kind of all, whoops, 
there we go. Where did this go? There we go. All of these annotations were kind of like there together at the same same time. And then we see more from from you, Alan, and more, more from Paul. And Alex. so now we start to see the kind of the temporal you know qualities of the of, of the activity. And as we're speaking and as I'm <laughs> fumbling through my screen sharing, folks might have also noticed this little red arrow appeared right here as well. Um, I'm gonna brag and say that it was about five or six years ago <laughs> when I went to Hypothesis and I said, what's really challenging is that the sidebar updates in real time when people are annotating synchronously. Ah. And so if you do have a lot of people on a text, and at this point in time, and Alan, you, you actually mentioned this in our last conversation, you know, there was a time when I was really interested in the idea of flash mobs, which I've actually increasingly seen as a pretty um, not precise enough analogy for what I see actually happening here. But at the time, I was like, well, if we get all these people to read and annotate together, it's kind of like a flash mob. And mm -hmm. what people were providing to me as a facilitator in their feedback is actually that it was way too incoherent. Mm -hmm. It was way too hard to understand what was going on. And that was both a facilitation limitation on my on my part as a facilitator but it was also a technical limitation which is that the hypothesis sidebar every time a new annotation was added it was automatically adding these we might call these annotation cards every individual annotation is like its own card some of them become threaded conversations when we get replies to those conversations but these cards were then automatically updating and so they were jumping all over the place and and readers who wanted to do so maybe thoughtfully and slowly and really pay attention to a particular area of the text. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do that. And so Hypothesis quickly devised um, in conversation with us this very nice and useful technical feature that indicates that there's a annotation. In this case, if you hover over it, it says one new annotation. This will actually show you how many have been added. And then as the reader, I'm given the control when to update this. As the reader, I can say, okay, I want to now update this. And because I've organized this by newest first, when I update this, we'll see if this works, live demo, this card should appear at the top of the sidebar. And it might have been a reply. And so in that case, here it was, at least yeah. from Alex here, speaking of which, right, we've got, a, we've got a reply from two minutes ago. And so that was to me a really important example where the social reading experience among a group of readers is going to inevitably be very, very different for people. Some people want to read more quick. I have to credit you, Randy, because both those things you just show me, I've been looking yeah. at this interface for years. I yes, never I tried. Never yeah. yeah, I've spent so much time like just living in this yeah. sidebar um, because I value the technology. It is an open source technology, as I think folks know. I think there's a lot of organizational transparency and goodwill from Hypothesis to kind of mm -hmm. support these kinds of efforts. And they've been very responsive when people who are readers and who are annotators want to meaningfully engage in these kinds of activities. And they found their way not only, you know, from kind of these, dare I say, like bespoke little experiments that people are doing online mm -hmm. into the more robust features that are actually incorporated into things like a learning management system when people are using them in a class context. Um, and so it's all just to say that, you know, as, as I was mentioning, you know, briefly, social reading is going to be a very, um, well, variable experience. Some people are going to want to read a particular area. Some people want to read a larger area. Some people want to read very slowly. Some people want to read more quickly. Some people like the idea of responding kind of in the moment. And some people want to more thoughtfully curate their responses as an annotator. And so these technical features are very helpful when allowing people to really personalize actually the social experience. We're doing this together. Mm -hmm. We're doing so in an interactive way. It is a form of social reading, but we can still personalize the experience as we go about doing so. Um, so anyways, just a few things to, 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 to note here. But while we're talking, um, I mean, I've probably never used the page notes. That yeah. could be that could be a place to do some curation, right? Or um, it can be absolutely, absolutely. So page notes again. There are two types of annotations that we see here, 
attached to this particular text. So again, we have the OER recommendation. I'm going to go back and organize this by location so that I'm kind of brought back to the beginning of the text, the preamble here. And so we see here that we are looking at these annotations that are anchored to maybe a particular word. So here the anchor text is just the term preamble. Um, a little later on, we see another annotation, Alan, or excuse me, from, from you, Alex, you know, uh, you've, in this case, the anchor text is an entire, uh, I guess, clause maybe. It looks like it doesn't have a period there, so maybe it's a clause. Um, and you've added a few um, tags to, to that. And so your annotation is still anchored to a particular part of the text. And instead of your own commentary, you're adding some, some illustrative metadata. But what we're seeing in all of this are sections of the text that have been annotated. And those kinds of annotations, um, whether it's a word or an entire you know, clause or a sentence or a paragraph, those do differ from a page note. And a page note is associated with the entire document. A page note is not anchored to a word or a sentence or a clause or a paragraph. It's anchored to the document as a whole. And so there are a lot of creative ways to use page notes. Um, if you would, again, adopt an intentional stance towards how to use it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes a teacher, for example, might put discussion questions here, right? Yeah. So, hey, students, as you read this text, what are your thoughts about open education? Make sure that you add a few kind of additive annotations about open education as you read. You know, that kind of a question that's pretty global in scope right. could guide reading activities, and it might be appropriate here as a page note. But again, synthesis, um, kind of post activity reflections mm -hmm. could very much live here in the in the page notes as well. Yeah, and and now that I I mean I kind of attached my introduction to the preamble because um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I wanted to like draw attention to that. But I, the overall directions or call to action that we wanted to do could have gone in a page note if I had been thinking. Sure. About it. Sure. And and I think that this is where again some people may not understand that distinction. Yeah. Some people might not quite know where to look. Yeah. Um, in the project um, that I've done with the National Writing Project and the National Council of Teachers of English, it's a project that kind of gets educators to talk about equity-oriented literacy education. We, we call it the marginal syllabus. In that project, we do make use of the page notes really as that orientation space. We say, oh, hey, you're here. Like, you, you found this space. This is a page note. Um, here's some introductory information, like here's what the project is, and here's what we're doing here, and we even include, um, and I won't waste our time you know, running down an example, but we even will include a little image, like a screenshot mm -hmm. that actually shows you toggling from the page notes over to the annotations, you know, from here yeah. over to here, so that a reader, if they find themselves here, and they're new to hypothesis, they're new to this entire genre of social annotation, they at least have a visual cue that they can click here. And now they understand that they're in a space where the annotations are, again, or organized by location. Well, I mean, we could have a group like in, in a meeting or a setting, um, go through all the annotations and, and pick 10 notes that support a position and 10 that um, counter it. And you could have like a discussion within the page notes referencing those links. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, as I move through here, I, you know, again, like as somebody who really like, swims in annotations and particularly hypothesis annotations, there's just so much that I am already drawn to, even from these first few notes. Um, one is the inclusion, Alan, and your, you know, your initial note added to the preamble, you're including links. Um, this to me is such an important aspect of what is the intertextual qualities of annotation mm -hmm. you know when when you know glossators and scribes were annotating medieval manuscripts they may have referred to other texts um but the text that they were referring to somebody might have had to kind of stand up and walk over to a bookshelf and or like literally unchain a cabinet or or even the book that they might be referring to could be on another you know country or continent right like like you know the idea of readily referencing mm -hmm. and making accessible uh, so another another related text is done here so seamlessly and of course it's done just through a link and it's done through an embedded you know url and so the idea that the annotations now have these here to me is such a valuable feature of this so mm -hmm. it's intertextual we see that 
Um, we see this also as multimodal. You know, you're beginning to add in, you know, images, which is fantastic. And then to, you know, the example of Alex's annotation a few moments ago, and also in, in yours here, Alan, as well, we're seeing tags. And tags are a really fascinating practice in this kind of social annotation space. Um, what I'm noticing from Alan, what you've done is you've used a tag that's you know, associated with the conference, right? It's, it's kind of this tag itself has a kind of broader social life. And so if somebody was on Twitter um, or in some other space, maybe Facebook or even Instagram, perhaps, they might follow this tag and find related communities and open ed practitioners. And so there's a consistency there. Um, what you're modeling for us, Alan, to get a little technical is a more of a controlled vocabulary, right, of the tagging. Whereas to, you know, Alex, your, you know, um, tags here, you've added tags that are of personal relevance, are, are suggesting meaning making, are in, in my reading, in my interpretation, I would say more critically oriented. Mm -hmm. You've added the tags of decolonizing and indigenization, um, which are for you important tags to add. It's part of your meaning making process as you're annotating this text. And those tags might not appear again, or they may appear in your other annotations, but maybe nobody else's, or maybe I then begin to use them. But what this models for me is what some folks would call a, a, a folksonomy, right? Where the tagging is very emergent. It's kind of, dare we say, kind of grassroots oriented. It's kind of emerging from the individual ideas of readers as annotators. And it's different than the kind of more controlled, consistent, known tag that Alan modeled with OE Global 21. And I now, did. Neither is good or bad. They're just different ways of tagging texts, right? And, and I kind of wrestled whether I, I should like have a suggested vocab um, tag. Like it could be the action areas. It, it could be, I, you know, and then I just often feel like, it's another ask that, that people may feel like, oh, that's another thing to figure out. Um, so I'm kind of interested in the informal ones. But when I was um, talking with my colleague, Una Daly, who actually replied to your comment earlier, um, she works with a part of our organization that's uh, community colleges. And so um, I suggested when she's working with her community and they're adding things relevant to community college that they add a CCC OER, which is their public tag. But it's a way of aggregating within this, um, could be within this document or within all of annotation space, depending where you search on it. But you know, I think it has a lot of value. Um, I, I just didn't really land on the right spot to, to emphasize and I lean towards de-emphasizing. Oh, absolutely. Well, and so, but here's another example, you know, of another way to approach tagging. And I love that this just kind of pop, pops up, you know, Alex, five, minute, five minutes ago, you know, like five minutes ago, I added this again a, a few links, and then a tag, L O D L A M, which I am reading now as a mm -hmm. abbreviation or an excuse me an acronym, an acronym linked to open data in libraries, archives, and museums. Right. So now I've just learned something new. This is a little different than mm -hmm. the tag decolonization yeah. and indigeneity. Right. This is a different kind of category of a tag where, again, it's an acronym. <laughs> it's telling me, uh, you know, it's referring to a specific group it looks like or a project, for example. And in fact, this tag may appear elsewhere. I wouldn't be surprised perhaps now if you should tell us if people who are a part of these efforts are using this tag in other spaces, I could now follow that tag if I was on Twitter or I was elsewhere, but now you've brought it into our annotation conversation. Do you uh, mind, Alex, just giving us a bit of background on this, this, okay. this particular tag and comment? As you wish, but yes, it, it has been used precisely as this one hashtag. Mm. It's useful because it's unique enough that when you use Lodlam online, it's only about this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, because uh, Alan was talking about Glam, which is the same thing, but just in general, right? And especially Open Glam is very connected in CC Creative Commons, uh, the documentation for the course, uh, the training in Creative Commons specifically talks about GLAM and then mm -hmm. about linked open data. So the connection is meaningful, and especially since linked open data is about following those hashtags and having them unique. So it was on purpose, and I'll add another comment about 
the five star linked open data because it's been useful. That's brilliant. I, just, I, it's I, great. I, I love I love these stories. Yeah, I know. But I'm thinking like you always think Lodlam is like unique, and then you find it's used by some rugby club in, in like <laughs> Kazakhstan. <laughs> so you never know. But um, maybe just a slightly tiny technical question: like, does Hypothesis see uh, pound Lodlam as the same tag as Lodlam? Like, because um, sometimes when people get used to hashtagging tags, it messes up yeah. tag systems. Well, so let's actually jump over to crowd layers and I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like because I, I don't want to give the wrong technical answer here. My convention is to not use the hashtag symbol yeah. in a hypothesis annotation. So if I were to reply to this with just a tag, I would do so like this. Right. And there's the tag. And I'm going to just post it for the sake of a little test. I can go back and dilute it if we want to. Now, I did load this up while we were getting the screen sharing ready. Folks know that I and a dear friend and colleague of mine, Francisco Perez, have organized so what we call crowd layers. Now, this is going to also update in real time because we're putting the URL of this annotated text into, again, this kind of open, it's basically taking the learning analytics of this and bringing them into a kind of visual, social kind of space. Since I loaded this, there have been some additional annotations. So if I just simply search this again, it's going to be at 68 now. Okay. And so here is the annotation that I just added, Lodlam. You don't see any text because it was just the tag. And then here's Alex's annotation from a few moments ago with mm -hmm. the text. And then there is a tag that is noted here. And so there are 20 distinct tags associated with this text. And if we go down here in this crowd layers interface, hmm. and I actually need to move a little zoom thing out of the way, so excuse me for just a moment, but you're seeing that we have the tags coming through and let me just get this out of the way. Oh, I think they're separate. Get this out of the way. Yeah, you're seeing Lodlam here. Yeah. And you're seeing Lodlam here. And so we're seeing then this counted as two different tags because that hashtag symbol is a differentiation in some, in some respects, right? And so again, this is where the tagging feature of this is, again, it's pretty open-ended. We're not, again, as you were saying a few moments ago, Alan, like suggesting that people do or don't take this next step. But in certain contexts, in certain cases, maybe like a class when you do have people you know, perhaps annotating and using tags in certain ways, it can be helpful to say, hey, just use this version of the word maybe without that hashtag symbol. Although again, many people do think of tags and social tagging because of things like Twitter and Instagram as including that that hashtag symbol. So there's your, there's your <laughs> brief little response to, to that. Yeah, and I'm even looking in the hypothesis search, and I yeah, it's going to see yeah. it separately. Yeah. Um, but that's the fun. I mean, we've been talking some about, you know, and a lot of our conversation is is like reaffirming that this stuff is messy, but that's okay. Well, and I think that's some, something that I would really want to emphasize: is this stuff is absolutely messy, and that that's part of reading together. And my hope, and even if this was being done in a course context, in a more formal educational context. Um, is that even this type of annotation activity is not meant to be like a final exam or, or something that even needs to be graded. Of course, I get this question a lot from educators that I talk to about this. I never grade my students' annotations because I know it will be messy. Right. And it's intended to be messy. And people will, of course, quote unquote, they think that they're making mistakes, quote unquote, through their annotation. And I said, this is all just like rough draft thinking. We're trying to share this information, which really gets at, Alan, your question and comment from earlier about kind of like what's next and really saying if, if this is kind of messy and if this is a space for people to kind of work through their own thinking their own meaning making these types of social interactions something else can happen with them and that other thing might be maybe a little bit more polished quote unquote right yeah, yeah. And, and, and alex is asking in the chat a good question that comes up a lot like who feels included um and, and you know yeah it varies depending on the, the scope of the project. Um, mm -hmm. Like Nate's included, because he just showed up in the, the room here. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, and some of this discussion about like who feels like um, 
it's okay for me to be participating here. And then it becomes, is it a performative act? Um, and then, I mean, you get into, yeah, well, you can do private groups and, and that sort of bit. Um, so, um, you know, but, but I wonder because we're trying to invite a large number of folks in here. Um, and, and, you know, I'm finding, you know, as easy as we know this is, I think there's still some, some, some kind of like threshold of um, acceptance and understanding that, that this is okay and worthwhile for me to be doing. Um, and so Absolutely. how do we get people to that point is, is the billion dollar question. Right, I think there's always gonna be that initial, you know, do I feel welcome? Can I be here? Can I get over that, 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 that threshold, as you say, Alan, aspect of this? And we talked a little bit about that in our recent conversation. Um, but to get back to really Alex's question about kind of inclusion and who feels welcome, I think that we need to recognize that these kinds of digital spaces are always going to be kind of shot through with power dynamics and questions of who is and isn't welcome and who's going to be included and who's not going to be included. Mm -hmm. So I think that, again, in this particular, and, and, I, and I, without, again, like touting it too much, um, you know, Ontario and I really try and unpack this to some degree in our book. You know, there's a whole chapter dedicated to power. I'm increasingly seeing my work as attentive to issues of, of thank you, Nate, thank you, <laughs> like issues of kind of equity and, and presence. Um, I will also say in a slightly different way that just today, although it's been in works for, for months actually, um, I just had a piece written out now around people actually annotating books and, and writing on books in a kind of young adult literature space. Um, and I think that that's also really a, provocative and to me actually the most interesting example of power in annotation that I've seen in a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just fascinating what's been happening with this particular book called Melissa and the author's involvement and the publisher's response. Anyways, that's a whole thing and I've been very wrapped up in thinking about it and I apologize for shifting there, but I think it, it does actually get back to Alex's question, which is this really is all about power and presence. And really it's all about the questions of like who is welcome to annotate and who can annotate and whose voice and whose opinion can be here. And so I do think that again, in this particular project with the OER recommendation, there are already a few important um, decisions that you've all made that make this more welcoming, that make this easier for people to see themselves as playing a role. One of the things that we talked about a few moments ago is the language, you know, you could have just suggested that people come to the English version of this text, um, but you didn't. And you know, you said that there are multiple languages here that people can annotate. And Alex, you know, I, I I saw earlier, and I guess I'm still screen sharing, so I can just bring this over. You know, Alex, you have a lot of annotations here, and if I'm not mistaken, all the annotations on this page are in French. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is one way of saying, "Hey, you are welcome here." Mm -hmm. um, that's, I think, really in, in, an important decision that you've made. A second decision that you've already made is this idea of kind of multiple um, kind of pathways to participation. And so, you know, it was really nice to be involved in the podcast, you know, recently that I guess went live this morning. That's kind of providing some kind of broader context of my annotation. There's now this kind of open office, kind of open office hours or open lab time for people to just kind of come and play and annotate and hang out. You know, I know that there's also gonna be, you know, invitations where people are gonna be, you know, hey, you, with your expertise and your specialization, come and annotate. And so these are kind of modeling different participation pathways that I do think can make people feel more welcome and that their opinions and their contributions are very important to this, this endeavor. But regardless of what notes are or are not added, um, there's always gonna be that question of power and presence hmm. um, with these types of texts. And that's, that's not something that can be solved, but it can hopefully be very intentionally uh, facilitated and discussed as a project like this, you know, moves forward. Yeah, that, thanks, this is so good. I, I, I kind of want to go back, like the structure of this document, like when I was like looking at it and trying to just get my head around it, um, Mm -hmm. This whole introductory thing with the, the long clauses of the whereases and the hither to fours. Um, I mean, it's important. It's establishing the evolution of this. So, um, but there's like, um, I mean, and that could be a place where people wanted to, they can sort of add notes that sort of 
attached to you know the Cape Town Declaration and the meeting um, in Slovenia that that you know establishes and that would be really good. Um, but there's many. I mean, sometimes there's so many places where you might find like the word you know copyright or um, or language, and so there's multiple places where you can hang the annotation. So I wonder if that um, presents problem or opportunities. Um, because it's not like there's a single place where an annotation might fit in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, yeah. That's a really, really great question, Alan, particularly for a text like this, uh, which is where these annotations live. Where's the kind of strategic place to anchor this particular note in this particular place for people to find? Um, and I don't think I have a really good answer for that because I think that a lot of that concerns like how does the individual reader understand their response and then their decision to say, I wanna put it here. But I will say this then, because I kind of just hedged on the question a little bit and I'll kind of kick things over to, 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 you know, to Nate here, but I will show one more thing in a moment. Hypothesis has technically provided the ability to link to annotations. So when I look at any annotation, I can use this little, it's an interesting little icon here. It kind of suggests that there's this little annotation that's living anchored to a text that I can share it. And so when I share it, I'm given a link, which I can then immediately, although it's a very long text and it's kind of a bit of gobbledygook, it doesn't really matter because I can just copy it to my clipboard. And I've then copied a link to this particular annotation. And so if there was in your example, Alan, three or four or five different examples of a term or a phrase or an idea and you really wanted your annotation to be like well i want you to look here but oh. then it shows up again six seven ten paragraphs later you could say hey remember i had my initial thoughts about it here yeah or i explained myself here or if there was a conversation like this thread at some point you could use this share function and copy it and then kind of reference people back to that initial place where you made your mark. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, and so now I'll, I'll put you on the spot. Like, let, let's say you're going to add the marginal syllabus project to this document. Where would you go? To this document? Yeah. I mean, I think that I am increasingly interested in the marginal syllabus project as an example of people who have begun to identify a shared interest want to then read and annotate, debate, and discuss that together in a kind of open way and use it as an open model. So I know that the OER recommendation beyond particular practices and policies does to some degree talk about creating kind of models for open learning, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I see a project like the marginal syllabus is actually not particularly innovative, although I think we've done a few interesting and notable things, but we've essentially said in this kind of context of open ed, of open learning, here's a way to create a open project where people who share an interest have some technical skill and are eager to kind of come together can do so using openly accessible texts, using open source hypothesis software, creating openly, you know, kind of publicly shared annotations and inviting in their networks and their colleagues. And then here's a model that then you could use in your space and context and, and to me that fits right in with capacity building like it, it's right way exactly to, yes. yes yes exactly and i i, I wouldn't want to um uh, again humbly suggest that this is like you know um and i gotta run again <laughs> That's um, a, I thank you just so had a, another person show up at the house i'll fill you in about this later nate but I got to take a few minutes and deal with a plumbing okay. situation. It's very good. Thank you for uh, this. So good to see everybody. Be in touch. Um, this is a little pleasure, a real pleasure. Thank, thank you. This is okay. This is all conversational, but we're just, you know, trying to get a feel as if we were having a, a we, we were actually sitting in the same room and, and like, you know, talking about um, either the, the document or, or what we see in it or how, um, what we might want to see in it. Um, you know, and so, I mean, we were talking a little bit about, um, yeah, and my, my feeling when I first started with this, it, it's, I would say an interesting document, like it, it's not, you know, it's not a paper and obviously, and it, it's not, um, you know, a, a novel, um, it's, it's got a very specific structure, 
um, and, and just wondering about like what lends itself or maybe not um, to sort of um, soliciting people to sort of say like, I, I have something to contribute here that, that can help clarify. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that one of the first things I see when I open the document, of course, is that, you know, it's, as you guys were discussing before, it's, it's kind of written in this sort of legalese style, which I think there's a way in which just your casual reader that it, you sort of glance off that, right? Like, if you're not coming in with a kind of distinct purpose, it can be like, whoa, it's a wall of text written in a language I don't normally care to read that much. And so um, it makes me think, you know, there are other kinds of texts that might have this effect as well. You know, for instance, um, you know, scientific papers, for example, you know, uh, it's funny, I was just rereading Thomas Kuhn's Structure of Scientific Revolutions. I don't know if you guys know that book. Alex apparently does. Um, <laughs> really great seminal work, um, to use a weird bad word, uh, important work. And um, it's, uh, you know, it talks about how different sort of, well, he's focused on science, but how different, you know, gr groups of people, discourse groups end up shifting from one way of looking at the world to another. Then that whole idea of a paradigm shift in thinking is a phrase that kind of came out of Thomas Kuhn's work. But at any rate, one of the things that's, that's, that often signals a paradigm shift is when um, you know that the actual texts of a community become sort of opaque and dissatisfying to enough members of the community, so they want they either don't engage with them or they want to move on. And so I think there's something about the approachability of the text that is at play here. And then the second thing, though, I would say is that I think annotation is a way to break through that that um, you know the. Op the opacity of the text and give people uh, um, a handhold in their thinking to engage with the text. And we see that, as I'm bringing this up all the time, but we see that a lot in the AAAS Science in the Classroom project that uses annotation, what they call lenses, in order to enable people to better dive into the opacity of, um, of uh, scientific texts. Um, I thought I was going right to the actual site and I wasn't. Here we go. Um, oops, I'm not very good at navigating these computer things. Uh, yeah, and I'll just put this into the chat for the record, but um, so they use annotation here in scientific articles in order to do, um, and I'll just jump to one in order to, uh, kind of give people a, a way who maybe aren't used to reading scientific texts, a way to sort of break into it. And so they've got the whole scientific paper here, and this is a formal published work, right? And then what they've done is they've actually used hypothesis annotation behind the scene to um, uh, establish these sort of learning lenses. And so you can like flip on or off different learning lenses. And so I flipped on the glossary one and that highlights certain words um, and it kind of like gives you a guidepost to what they are. So they built a kind of new interface layer on top of the annotation layer. But you know what can be really great about this is results and conclusions. If you're a newcomer to the world, you'll realize that a lot of each scientific paper is not about the results and conclusions of the experiment, right? Mm -hmm. Very little is highlighted here when it comes to results and conclusions. So if you're a student, this gives you some ad holes in, in your reading, right? Um, and so I guess we could go back to what we're working on here and think about it a little bit the same way. And I think your, your, um, the, you know, the root annotations that people have provided uh, give our can form those little handholds, like here's a spot to maybe focus your attention and grow out from here. Um, so I think that, I think that's a good thing to try to do. But I think that the other issue though is going back to that marginal syllabus example of when I come to this text, am I part of some sort of community that is gonna, that has a different reason for being and then reading and commenting on this text helps support that community's reason for being. And so I guess the question then is what are the communities that already have 
the reason to want to read and engage with a fairly opaque text like this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's the probably the OER community comes to mind, right? Um, but that's a really big amorphous thing. And then it makes me think of your colleague Una, right? Like, okay, so Una leads a community within the community that's focused on OER. And so I could imagine some, some almost kind of like scheduled sessions where people in the um, CCC OER community, <laughs> um, you know, actually come together. And maybe you've already planned something around that. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're trying. And, and, you know, as, as far as like trying to think of reasons why I, at a minimum i think it's a good place for people to like pin the work that they're doing um to so th this is where our work fits into like the larger sphere of the, this global open education movement and so um you know so if, if you're running a project or if you're doing a, a translation you know um oer experiment if you're doing something of, of a research study um, you know, why not say like, you know, this is what our group is doing here, um, learn more um, about this. So I, I think, you know, it, it sometimes it sounds like, yeah, like show off your work, but I think it's like share it um, in a place where it can mingle with, with others, um, which to me always creates the possibility that you're going to, you know, um, because like I, I was just adding some examples of um, it, we've had these great discussions about um, technologies that allow people to do internet things where there's no internet, you know, the offline internet sort of capabilities, internet in a box. And there, there's tons of them. And so every time I do some research, I find more that I know about. Um, and I, I think um, it, it does a lot um, to show, you know, what OER is capable of doing um, in terms of, of being um, inclusive and, and expanding access um, because of some of these you know, sometimes experimental efforts, um, but creative efforts to sort of bring these capabilities to places where um, there's not fiber coming out of the ground. Right, or power even necessarily, right? Or power, so. Um, yeah. So, you know, you know, if there was, you know, thousands of notes here, it, it could be interesting and in, in that messy saturation that um, Ramey talks about. Um, Unfortunately, you've hit another sore point, which is that hypothesis isn't enabled for offline access right now. <laughs> <laughs> I did demonstrate another thing, right? I, I used the search bar in the hypothesis sidebar okay. to search for CCC OER. Right. And that then highlighted any annotations that actually mentioned that, of which there are three. Right. Right. And I see this one. And when I click on them, it jumps to that point in the text. Right. Yeah. So it jumps to this one that your other colleague, Paul Stacy, added, right. where he decorated this phrase, create networks of experts, with a mention for the work that you guys do at Open Education Global, including CCCLER. So there's a really good example in a way that you can use the tool to find such things. Like, did anyone talk about CCCLER yet on this document? Excellent. Yeah. And so it, it sort of becomes, I, um, I, may, I think even Marcel says that we're turning this document into a, an OER itself, um, in, in a way. Yeah, and actually, it, it really technically is because <clears throat> we could go into this, but um, annotations made in the public layer in Hypothesis are uh, are uh, thrust into the public domain through a CC zero declaration. So they're even a little bit more than open. <laughs> was, was there, uh, I was just curious, was there a debate over that or do people object? To oh that? yeah. There's a really great GitHub issue thread that you can read at your leisure if you want that included people, you know, from, not just hypothesis people, but people from Creative Commons and, you know, lawyers and everybody weighing in on the different choices. Yeah. And we could, we could, re we could recreate that here, but I don't think I have the uh, aptitude for it. <laughs> That's okay. No, I don't want to. I just, um, I, I think it was, I don't know when I first noticed it, but I was like, oh, that's interesting. I, I bet people do get caught up in, in that. Um, yeah. And that's just the public layer. What, I mean, what I'd love to see. And so there's no licensing attached to any of the other layers, the group layers or the private layer or whatever. So that means they, at least in the U.S. jurisdiction, they default to fully copyrighted, right? So uh, I would, what I would love to see is some kind of license chooser capability. So either as a general preference or an, that could maybe be overridden on a particular annotation, you know, the author could choose whatever 
copyright status they wanted for their own work. Yeah. Oh my gosh, of course, Alex Lane found it probably. <laughs> oh, that's the problem with having these, these social butterflies in the chat. <laughs> I tell uh, you, it, let's it, see, that looks right. Yeah, 48 comments. Yeah, yeah. I think this, you might have found want, it. You want Alex in your webinar audience. He, he just lights totally. it. <laughs> and, and we often do, I think, which is great. Thank you for coming to so many liquid margins, Alex. Yeah, yeah, this is interesting. At the same time, I learned like, really? We're talking about the license of a, a, a note. Um, but. Which brings me to another issue that I have around openness, where it's just like the fixation on licensing and copyright, I feel like gets in the way so often of, you know, it's like, before you can even think about open, you have to have understood everything about not only normal copyright law, but also open licensing. And just like the friction involved with that is so immense that I think it turn, can turn some people away. Right, right. Well, and I, I think I added a note this morning, because like, there's some um... There's some language towards the beginning about like um, uh, understanding of open licenses and copyright in, in jurisdictions and like I wish I kept more track of these but when I'm looking for my uh, open license media to use in Wikimedia Commons like you come across some of the strangest like special cases of licenses about that are geographic specific or um, reflect, you know, certain, you know, exemptions to things published in certain years in Germany. And, and so it's, it's never cut and dry. I think I might have found your note. Was it this one that I'm showing on my screen? Yeah. There? yeah. So again, I used the search tool. Yeah, to find that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, any other like words of wisdom from inside hypothesis? Nate? <laughs> well, I was going to say, I know you guys knew this, but you know, Remy was showing off the, you know, links to specific annotations, right? There's also up here, the same icon gives you a link to the whole document. So it opens it up with hypothesis and the sidebar enabled, but not on any particular um, annotation. So if you kind of want to share the whole document, that's a great link to use <clears throat> um, as well. Oh, great, great. Yeah, that, I mean, it was somewhat of a reason to do this in press books. Um, so we didn't have to like spend time telling people how to install a browser extension. I always feel like for sure. You lose people. <laughs> and I think it's smart enough now so that even it recognizes that press books already has hypothesis there and right. it doesn't confuse things. So, yeah. Um, and I mean, everybody, of course, knows I hope that by clicking on your little person icon in the upper right, you can also get to, um, uh, one sort of profile page, which is an interface that one can use to explore in this case, because I've got me as a user up here, you know, all my annotations, but I could also, you know, look for any of CogDog's. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and that's, that's public annotations, at least. And, you know, I've, um, I've tried to make a case that if you're doing like research or something like this, this is like, an incredible tool like you know instead of having like highlights you know in yellow ink and in many books that you got to go flip through and find like here's your whole annotation record um along with whatever notes you, you applied it's like this is like an insanely powerful research tool yeah especially i mean for one's own notes of course but one can also i'm trying to remember what maha's uh hypothesis username was, but I couldn't offhand. But at any rate, uh, yeah, but you could also look into what other people are doing, right? At least what they've made public or what you have access to because you're in shared groups. Right. So you're not gonna, it's, you wouldn't see anything that was private that you didn't have access to this way. You can also search for, you know, broader terms. Uh, so we can see, oh, there's actually only been, so somebody mentioned them on the French version, mm -hmm. CCCOER, but then there's some other uh, some other only eight public annotations that include the term CCC OER. Linda, Linda's got some work to do. No, just kidding. Okay, what, what, which tag was yours, Alex? Uh, lob lamb or lamb lob? <laughs> yeah, and you can also search by tag specifically. Yeah. If you, you and lod lamb, L O D L A M. Like this, lod lamb. Yeah, 
there it is. <laughs> and I also noticed going back to our other question about languages, right? One could um, one could do a, a French Harris French. Okay. I'm kind of surprised it's so low. And some of the oh, these are the yeah, these are the um, these are the documents. So you can open these up. Right here, this is the document, but then here's the annotation itself. Right. Or maybe for those of us who speak Spanish. Oh, hmm. oh, I did it wrong. There we go. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, what do Kevin Durant, James Harden, David Beckham, and Matthew McConaughey have in common? <laughs> <laughs> interesting I to know that <laughs> yeah i was wondering i was I actually had that question but that, that's that's interesting so hypothesis is denoting language um from the operating system right so yeah i'm guessing that that's some kind of metadata that would be pulled in from the annotator system yeah i don't i don't know the details on that yeah, um, i didn't know but just, yeah there you well, go we just had Excellent. A conversation uh, alex nowen talking about um, annotation on Francais. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, specifically about this uh, action area in building capacity, uh, one of the first things I noticed is, it, is actually building capacity and reinforcing capacity are not the same thing. Like I, I think part of the way it's been translated has been adding uh, some interesting things to uh, the meaning of what it is. And something we noticed earlier, uh, we had a little bit of a chat earlier about the fact that some dates were wrong in the mm -hmm. French version. I, I, I think that's very significant in terms of it's likely been written in English first, or at least that part where the typo was made was probably written in English first, and then there was a typo uh, when it was converted uh, into French, like translated and such. And I think that's pretty significant in terms of who connects with what at what point. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, so I, I guess I could go through a few annotations I put there. Um, and they were coming from different origins, like at different times, like five hours ago and then uh, 40 minutes ago, uh, based on conversations we were having, but also some prior um, ideas I had. So one thing, uh, one annotation that I put just before I came back online uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, so I'd say probably two hours ago, um, yeah, actually almost exactly uh, two hours ago, it's that this there's this set of resources, and I'll find them again uh, right here. So the set of resources uh, that, are, that come from our network. So I work for Quebec's college network, uh, which is very specific. It's, it's pretty unique, like it's uh, pre-university and or uh, vocational training mm -hmm. and uh, so for pre-university it's required training and uh, for for vocational training it's actually it can be enough to to get a very good job including for nurses and and, su and such so this training for people who will be in um, uh, childhood uh, child care centers Mm -hmm. Right, CPE is a term in French, in Quebec French specifically, Centre pour la petite enfance, uh, so early ch childhood uh, centers. Uh, so those students in college, and those colleges we call them CGEPs, those students go through training to to then be, you know, uh, to employees of those uh, childhood childcare centers. Mm -hmm. When they go through the training like there's a set of resources that are so specific right it's really niche and in the spirit of that uh, there's this uh, uh non-profit that's part of a, a one of the colleges that's called the uh, ccdmd uh, so centre collégial de développement de matériel didactique so they create learning material developing learning material for colleges right so their resources are not technically 
OERs. And they specifically say usage rights, um, that they require people, th those resources are offered uh, to teachers and students in uh, Quebec Scholars Network. They can be used only for educational and non-commercial purposes, mm -hmm. you know, which could be similar to NC licenses, but even then, uh, they specifically say like they maintain the copyright and all of that. They're very specific about this, which is fine. Like it's their prerogative. But personally, I find that it's really in the spirit of OER. And because it's done with resources that are created in the communities. So in this case, Première Nation, First Nations, as uh, people might know in Canada, we distinguish between First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit. So altogether, all indigenous groups. Um, but for First Nations and specifically Cree and Inu uh, mm. on in different parts of Quebec. And interestingly enough, uh, as far as I hear, uh, Cree people tend to use English as, you know, the contact language, and Inu in other regions of Quebec uh, tend to use uh, French. And so uh, those resources are really meant for those communities, you know, to, to work in those communities, and they contain basically video clips, like this one is 50 seconds mm. of toddlers playing freely, right? Uh, a baby playing freely, and then there are suggestions of exercises, including in English. So basically saying, uh, you know, here are the objectives, and those objectives come from the Ministry of Higher Education. Right. The activity is four hours. The video is 50 seconds. Mm -hmm. And watch the video clip as a group or individually, and then you know divide into groups and discuss these things, including identify in a professional manner what the children are learning during this free play. Right? This is great pedagogical insight. Right? It's exactly the kind of thing that David Wiley was talking about. Those resources that are so tied to a specific situation that you can't extricate them from their context. At the same time, as an anthropologist by trade, I would say I could use the same resource and adapt it, you know, keeping the whole link, the whole thing saying like it's for my own purposes, but I can still send learners to that link and uh, saying, well, the recommendation talks about uh, First Nations, <laughs> you know, talks specifically about the uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples from 2007, and I, as far as I know, that date is right, recognizing Indigenous peoples' rights to establish their own national laws and, in, uh, you know, mettre en oeuvre, enable or, or put in place some national policies. Well, I find a strong connection between that recommendation and this kind of learning, especially since in those resources, there are resources about who's uh, responsible. I think it's, it sounds like it's uh, alphabetical order, but it's uh, who's responsible to teach uh, culture, to, to help uh, people uh, for culture. Mm -hmm. So, and, and basically making the point that it takes a village uh, to, to raise the whole community uh, I don't know if I find it right there, but I had found it earlier and I found it, you know, immensely insightful uh, that, um, you know, there, there are these ideas, oh yeah, because it's in interviews, it's not uh, an observation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to whom belongs the role of uh, cultural transmission to children, right? That very point, it's just a short interview. I think it's a minute and a half. And, and it basically says, like, it belongs to the entire people, tout un peuple, mm -hmm. a people. Uh, so the parents, the child care center, the school, and the entire community. And those points can be made anywhere. And we could annotate these because they're in the open in that sense. So they're not OERs, again, I, I fully understand this, but I think it's a discussion to have using annotation to say, well, linking those things uh, together can really help in terms of 
strengthening, like strengthening capacity, building capacity in OER. It's not just using OER or well, CC license resources. It's also about building links to resources that are not OER, but that you can use in an open education context. Uh, I think that's uh, pretty strong. And speaking of linking data, I keep using the same thing, which also exists in French. So that's pretty useful. And I will certainly uh, bring it in the document. I'll put a notation somewhere um, that for open data, you can have a PDF, especially a PDF that's an image of something like an OER very commonly can be a PDF, right? That's not accessible for people with uh, site uh, impairments and, and such, it's still open, but it's not very open. If you have the data in that file in an Excel file, that's probably a little bit more inclusive because you can actually get the data. Mm -hmm. And we can certainly find a lot of cases where an OER is in a format that, yeah, technically it's open, and you can get to the data, but then it's proprietary software. You need to use Excel, that's not so good. Then using a CSV file, which you can open with anything, including just the text file itself, all the way to RDF, uh, which links you know, uh, the statements together with unique identifiers. And then at the end that you have linked open data. So uh, we talked earlier uh, before the recording about uh, LUDLAM. So linked open data for libraries, archives, and museums. Uh, it's something that I like a lot uh, because it's pretty unique. As far as I, I found, the hashtag itself hasn't been used elsewhere. So. Linking to that document from the recommendation, which does talk about uh, libraries. So if I search for, yeah, this one, uh, I'll check. Yeah, I didn't uh, quote, uh, put that link. So I'll respond to my own <laughs> annotation. Uh, and maybe I should put the same hashtag. Uh, because Creative Commons themselves, like the, the foundation itself, uh, is providing some uh, learning material for people in the OER movement, which is specifically connecting to libraries, archives, and museums. I think we're all in that same boat, uh, and that can we can uh, certainly work together. No, that uh, I we we've been talking about this, and I think it's really good. Like, are we going to get stuck? in a circle of OER where it has to be something that's openly licensed with all the five R's. Um, whereas, I mean, what you're showing doesn't prevent that from being used somehow um, open right. um, for someone to learn from. So it's not like you can't create a learning experience. Yeah, on top of it, precisely. It's, it, it's a kind of thing of like, no, you can't, like we tend to say non-derivative licenses are not, make them, those resources, not OERs. I fully agree. If you can't adapt it, it's not an OER. We're fine with that. So it, and I'm not sure if the recommendation, I don't remember, um, but it's pretty clear that, uh, so free, free as in no cost, gratuit in this case really means no cost. So redistribution is no cost, but also adaptation should be, you know, open and free. Uh, and by the way, because libre, uh, because open is both libre and ouvert, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of discussion in French as to which word we use. For OER, we do say, we do say, uh, REL, uh, Ressources Educatives Libre, but for open education these days, uh, and I think you know uh, Barbara Class, yes. uh, who's been uh, working on this journal about Education Ouverte et Libre. Mm. Uh, she's done a seminar, a webinar at uh, OE Global Francophone. And I do hope I don't show anything in my history that's incriminating, but uh, I think that's probably fine. Um, she did one of those webinars specifically about defining open and free 
mm-hmm. uh, in those ways. Free, libre is basically like free in that sense, like freedom. Yeah. Uh, and uh, ouvert is basically uh, like open in general, but we tend to associate the two. So uh, in terms of the recommendation itself, like some of my annotations could be some things like, well, is it libre or is it ouvert? And people have endless discussions in French, like including in Quebec, we tend to, uh, to have long philosophical discussions about these things, um, about openness and, and freedom. And I think it's also pretty useful. <laughs> well, very well said. It's, it's, uh, it's always- Yeah, so licence ouverte is not the same thing as licence libre. Yes. So openly licensed is not the same thing as a free license, yeah. uh, that kind of thing. So I think it, it, it really helps to, to put the, the thing there. Excellent. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Alex. It's been thank great. you.